Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first Marketing Club webinar for the 2022-2023 academic year. Today, we'll be hearing from Daniel Rowles on the latest trends in digital marketing. Daniel has been a keynote speaker at our flagship digital summit conferences since 2013 and presented many CIM webinars for us over the past few years. He is a marketing course director and also a fellow of CIM. He has over 25 years experience in digital marketing, is CEO of Target Internet, and is an award-winning author. He is also the voice of the Digital Marketing Podcast, which is listed in the top 10 iTunes business podcasts. So he really knows his stuff, and it's an absolute pleasure to have him with us again for today's webinar. So before we get started with Daniel's presentation, I'll just very quickly go over the format for today's session, how you can get involved in the live Q&A, and what the Marketing Club is. If you've watched any of our Marketing Club webinars before, then you'll know how this works. But essentially, we'll be hearing from Daniel for around 45 minutes. We'll then move into a 10 to 15 minute live Q&A session to answer some of your questions. If you registered for the webinar, you'll be able to post your questions for the Q&A at any time during the session by clicking on the question mark. If you're watching on a laptop, you'll find the question mark on the right hand side of your screen or along the top or bottom if watching on a tablet or smartphone. If you're watching us live on YouTube or Facebook and would like to take part in the Q&As in future webinars, you'll need to register for the session either via the CIM events page or through our posts on the socials and watch via the GoToWebinar platform. Daniel has very kindly agreed for his slides to be available to download whilst we're broadcasting. So if you'd like a copy, just click on the handouts icon and you'll find them in there. If you want to watch the session again, it'll be available on our YouTube channel just head into the playlist section and find the Marketing Club folder. You'll find the entire back catalogue of our Marketing Club series to date in there too, with sessions covering a broad range of marketing skills and personal skills, all free to access and available whenever you want. So I'll quickly explain what the Marketing Club is. The Marketing Club was created primarily to help students get the most from their CIM accredited degree and prepare them for a career in marketing. Although the Marketing Club is designed for students, so our members and other marketing practitioners are also welcome to attend the sessions. For the uninitiated, the CIM accredited degree program enables students to gain a professional marketing qualification by taking advantage of the exemptions the accredited degree provides. If you're a university student, you can sign up there to receive the Marketing Club newsletter. Simply take a photo of the QR code you see on screen and that will take you straight through to the sign up page. Alternatively, you can hop onto our website and find the Marketing Club page in the Qualifications drop-down menu. Each edition of the newsletter will provide you with content designed to support your studies and actively manage your professional development by keeping you up to date with the latest trends, innovations, and concepts in the marketing industry. So it really is worth taking a look and signing up. We'll pop the QR code up again after Daniel's presentation, so don't worry if you haven't had a chance to capture it yet. You may also be interested in our international student competition, the pitch which is designed to recognize and reward the marketing talent of the future. Each year we task undergraduate marketing and business students in their second or third year of university with a real life marketing challenge. This year's challenge has been set by leading global brand, We Are Eight, and allows students to apply their learning from their degrees in teams of two or three. For more information about the competition, visit our website using the QR code you can see on screen. And don't forget to register your interest by the 2nd of December. If you'd like to share any thoughts about today's webinar on the socials, you can use the hashtag CIM events. We'd love to see your comments, the good, the not so good, and everything in between. So I'd now like to introduce our guest speaker, Daniel Rowles. If you'd like to turn your webcam on, Daniel, I'll pass things over to you and the floor is yours when you're ready. Thank you very much indeed, Phil. Uh, good to see everyone here today. So we're gonna take a look at the latest trends in digital marketing for 2022 and taking us into 2023. Uh, as Phil said, I'm Daniel Rolls. I am CEO of Target Internet and we work with lots of the brands that you'll know, helping them upskill their teams and essentially doing a lot of the stuff we're gonna be doing today and showing them how to kind of use this stuff in practice. Uh, I'm also a program director at Imperial College. These are some of my MSc students. Uh, and as I said, I do the Digital Marketing Podcast, which is now the number one marketing podcast uh, in most of the world, um, which is great, which means we're beating people like McKinsey and so on. And what's interesting about that 
is that it costs almost nothing to create that podcast. So I will touch on to that a little bit later on. I've written a few books. I'm not going to talk about those at all. I promise I want to get straight into the trends. So in October, I was lucky enough to go over to Boston in the US and go to the HubSpot conference, Inbound 2022. And as well as speaking, I, I saw lots and lots of talks and it was an interesting kind of insight to where we are in digital marketing. And we are at a bit of a turning point. There's a lot of things that are happening at the same time that are having a big impact on what we're going to do going forward. So it's an interesting time to do a trends webinar. Now, what, one of the things that HubSpot launched at the event was their HubSpot community. If you want to take a look at this, it's community.hubspot.com. And, and what's happening is that we've got a couple of things that are creating a bit of a perfect storm and making digital marketing a lot harder. And those are things around privacy. So it's getting harder to get to people. Uh, content burnout we've got too much content and we're overwhelmed by it and therefore if we don't own the relationships with our target audiences we are going to have problems now you'll go through and see their example of how they've created a community they've got discussion forums they've got loads of resources they've got groups of people that get together separately um, under their advocacy tab that you can see there they've actually got the HubSpot fans they're such a popular platform that they've got a kind of fan group which is essentially a fan group for a piece of software so it's interesting how they've managed to create this community and this passion around their product. And that's by tying together live events, connecting people and making that much very human connection. So I wanted to start by talking about this content burnout and this community piece. And then I'm going to go into privacy because that's going to be part of this. And then we're going to get into artificial intelligence because that's having a huge impact on all of these. So it's an interesting time to, to be in digital marketing. So I always show this whenever I do a presentation. It, this is internet live stats. It shows us the amount of content that's been published so far today based on the time that zone that I'm in. And the thing I would always point out, and if you've been on one of my presentations before, you would have seen this, over 4 million blog posts written so far today. That number is accelerating. And the reason it's accelerating is one, there's more people doing content marketing, but two, this artificial intelligence thing that I spoke about. It's now very, very easy to create content that even having to write anything yourself. And I'll show you how in a moment, I'll do a live demo of that as well. Um, the amount of videos viewed on YouTube, more than the searches done in Google. You know, there's more and more content. Lots of us using TikTok, Instagram Reels, all those kind of things. So it's a noisy environment. It's been noisy for a long time though. So why is that a bigger challenge? Well, it's getting faster. The level of content that's being created is getting bigger. But actually that's starting to switch us off. We're getting this kind of burnout. So I thought, look, I'll go to my Facebook this morning and I'll grab a screenshot of the kind of stuff that I'm seeing and why I'm not really using Facebook anymore. So I've gone through here and I've, I've kind of did an estimate this morning. About 60% of the content I'm seeing is now nothing to do with my friends, nothing to do with my family, nothing to do with people I'm connected to, but is now recommended content. So you can see here, there's a sponsored post trying to give me a standing desk, of which I already own a standing desk. Um, on the right hand side of the page, there's a couple of ads that are showing up and then I've got reels showing up. And a lot of the stuff that we see in reels, you know, trying to be a bit like TikTok, um, you know, it started with just wait for it. And they did not expect this. That really kind of clickbaity type stuff. Now it does work because intrigue makes us click on things, but I didn't really sign up to Facebook for this kind of stuff. So the algorithms behind these platforms are having a huge impact on how people are using these channels. Now, those of you that are active TikTok users will probably realize that the first impression you get of TikTok, you know, people dancing um, to music, is not really what you get when you've been using the platform for a while and you start to go down the rabbit hole of the algorithm really understanding you. However, what we're seeing in Facebook is that I'm getting a lot of kind of stuff that I don't really feel is relevant and actually isn't really why I was on the platform in the first place. So we're seeing this kind of fragmentation between platforms. But we're also seeing as marketers, we need to stay up to date to what's having an impact on the algorithms. Now, in reality, it's very hard now on any of the meta platforms, so in Facebook or in Instagram, to actually be able to get something to kind of go viral, to make it really grow and, and get there without being fairly sensationalist content. Whereas actually on TikTok, um, it's, and then LinkedIn actually as well, it's possible to still do that. So, with these algorithms, we've got what the platforms tell us is important, but we can also see how they're shifting. So for example, at the moment in LinkedIn, if your post gets lots of comments, that has a big impact on the algorithm and you tend to get a lot more visibility of that content. 
So understanding and staying up to date these algorithms becomes really important. But remember, there's a knock-on impact. So here's my little tip, practical tip. For example, if you go to LinkedIn and you do a post and you design it so it gets loads of comments, it gets loads of engagement. There's a, a window afterwards. If you post some other content, that content will get better reach because the algorithm has said, oh, this, this account is really you know, is doing things. We're going to make that content more visible. So I would always go through and try and say, right, I'm going to do this piece of content purposefully to try and really engage the algorithm. In this case, we're getting loads of comments. And then I'm going to paste something, maybe some video content afterwards that probably won't get as many comments, but that will help it get more visibility. So we need to kind of stay up to date on these algorithms. And um, I'll show you some places to look at it. One person that's great at this, by the way, is neilpatel.com. I saw him speak recently. It was a really insightful talk. But basically, he will publish on his website, neilpatel.com loads of things uh, about how the algorithms are changing and how you can really get the most from those as well. Universally video content, short form video content is working in everything from Twitter, LinkedIn, and obviously in Reels and uh, within TikTok as well. So definitely worth looking at that. So how do we build this community? Well, the problem is it used to be that you would go through to Facebook, for example, and you'd start a group, or you might have a LinkedIn group. The problem is, that within Facebook, some people don't really want to use Facebook anymore, and you can get a lot of negative stuff potentially happening in those groups. With LinkedIn groups, it was that they just get bombarded with spam, and not that many people really actively engage. So interestingly, we looked at the Digital Marketing Podcast, and the podcast being a very broadcast channel, I said, how can we build engagement? So what we will now do is we'll, we'll create that podcast. We will make sure it's in the places where those people want it. So it'll be on all the podcasting channels, Google, Apple, Spotify, and so on. But also we now do a video version. Um, we've only just really, really recently started doing this because we realized a lot of people were consuming that content from YouTube. And we didn't just want to post up the audio and just have some graphics in the background. So we've done a full, we've really gone into it from a video point of view now as well. But then how do we build community off the back of it? Well, interestingly, we've gone down the email route. That might sound a bit strange because email is kind of fairly broadcast. What we said is if you are a fan of the podcast, then if you sign up for the newsletter, we'll send this newsletter that will never have any sales and never have any ads in it. It's a purely going to share useful stuff. But also, if you reply to it, we will go through and we will come directly into my inbox. The team and myself will deal with it and we'll respond to you. And then what we've done is change the format of the podcast to have someone on the podcast, who's Louise in this case, who is there to be the voice of the customer. She sees there to take people's questions, to answer and pose those questions, to challenge us on what we're saying. So very much making the ownership of that broadcast stuff that we're doing, being kind of part of that community as well. So thinking about the content format. So we went from a two-person discussion per podcast to a three-person podcast with one person being the audience and being there to ask questions. I don't really understand that. What do you mean by that? and kind of playing dumb on the topic to help make sure that everybody understands stuff to bring in the questions that the audience might bring in. Now, the email that we send out is nothing particularly special. You can see it's not you know, particularly heavily designed or anything else, but it's three tips, tools, or techniques, no sales, no ads, and if you respond to it, we will respond to you. Now, your average click-through rate on an email, the open rate is about 20 to 22%, and the click-through rate is about 2.5% on average. Now, if we look at what we're getting for this, uh, we're getting a 46%. I mean, this is very, very early on. This is when there's only a couple of thousand people on the list. There's tens of thousands of people now. Um, and the click-through rate would be 2%. It's 24%. So it kind of shows that actually email can be a very social channel if you pitch it right and you don't use it to try and sell. And you're using it to kind of drive engagement. So thinking about what can you do that might drive community? What can you do that's a little bit different? because you want to try and own that relationship and you want to try and build up advocacy rather than just thinking about influencers, we're gonna try and go through and try and think about advocates. And it's that idea you might have heard from before, a thousand true fans. If you can get a thousand true fans, a thousand people that really care about your stuff and engage with you, that will really amplify things. Um, and what the team at HubSpot were saying is that if I talk to 10,000 people, that's you know, 10,000 possible conversations. Whereas actually, if 10,000 people are speaking to each other, that you know, it, it amplifies things hugely from that point of view, so that can make a real difference. So trying to get through this, there's too much content. How can I cut through that? And I will come back to content in a little while. But how can I cut through that noise? Well, what I really want is actual human engagement. 
and really, you know, we, we've been about that for a long time, but we, we're, we're really having to do this properly now. So thinking about how you might do that. Now, this brings me into these AI tools because we've seen an explosion of this recently. And if you haven't seen some of these things, grab the slides and, and take a look at them afterwards. This is where it, it all seemed to come together last week. Suddenly online, there was this, this podcast. And this was a podcast proposing to be Joe Rogan, very famous US podcaster, slightly controversial, uh, interviewing Steve Jobs. Now, as I understand it, I don't think these two people ever met each other, or if they did, they, they didn't actually do this interview. This interview was done completely by AI, but not only were the voices simulated to sound like Joe Rogan and sound like Steve Jobs, the script was created by an AI as well in their tone of voice. Now, if you listen to it, we're getting into this kind of uncanny valley of not really being able to work. Is this real? Is this not real? Now, if you listen to it for long enough, you start to go, yeah, this doesn't, it's not, it doesn't completely sensible, but it's incredible how quickly this has moved forwards. And the reason for that is that there are increasingly AI platforms, open source AI platforms or paid for platforms that other people can utilize. So you can utilize a platform that will simulate someone, it will learn someone's voice. I'll talk about that. Ones that will write deep for you, so they'll do natural language processing. They can deal with a lot of things about writing. We've got others that do art now, and these are becoming really widely available. So let's, let's delve into that a little bit. So for example, uh, if you go Google generated faces, there is a website, you go in, you say, I want a face of somebody that is a particular gender, a particular age, a particular ethnicity, and it will generate faces for you. You can change the background color, or all sorts of different things as well. These are useful for marketing purposes, but they're also unfortunately being used for things like fake LinkedIn profiles. So when you look at these, it's very, very hard to tell the difference. And I've told the story before, but I was doing a course, um, in this case, we were doing a course to create a government, uh, the engineering sector, and I showed this particular screenshot. And on the right hand side, the second one down, um, the guy that was watching said, oh, that's, that's a picture of my cousin. And I said, that isn't, that isn't your cousin. He said, no, no, that's definitely my cousin. And it, with this conversation went on for a little while, and he showed me a picture of his cousin and it looked almost identical to his cousin, but this person doesn't exist. We worked out the hairline was slightly different and a few other things as well. But we're starting to get into some quite strange territory because in digital marketing, we're getting access to these tools um, before anyone else. We're starting to see these tools appear. So let's take a look at some others that are quite interesting. Google is doing this now with image recognition. So you can now search with an image. So if I take a photo of myself or I take a photo of someone I'm walking past in the street, I can upload that. You can see the little image search photo button at the top right, and it will search and say, who do I think this is? Now I've taken a quite a common image of me here and dragged it down and it says, this is Daniel Rolls, here are his books, this is what he does, uh, and so on. So that's great, it's, it's recognized who I am. But the AI is learning. Um, and sadly, um, I did this another time with a different photo and they searched, upload this image, and it said senior citizen, which was slightly insulting. Uh, but there you go, we're all, we're, all, we're all getting slightly older. So um, these AIs are learning, and they're kind of shifting and changing. And even Google is using them within their search algorithms to try and improve the quality of things, to recognize images, uh, and so on as well. Um, I obviously look like all of those slightly bald men at the bottom of the page there as well. Um, so there you go, these, these are the things that happen to us as we get older. So there's some really interesting tools. This one I've, I've mentioned before, but I thought it's worth coming back to because it's changed. This is Descript.com. Um, and I will give you a toolkit at the end, by the way, that lists every single one of these tools and websites. And you'll have my contact details for reaching out if you can't find anything. Descript allows you to take audio and video and automatically transcribe it, which is brilliantly useful. Uh, not 100% accurate, but pretty good. But you can then edit the audio by editing the transcription. So I can cut a piece out and it will cut it out of the audio and seam it together. If I've interviewed someone and they um or uh a lot, there is a button that takes them all out of the audio. It's absolutely brilliant. The interesting thing about this is it's got five automated voices. So I could actually do a podcast on my own. I could get the automated voice. I just type something in and it will say it in one of these AI voices. And it's really good inclination and, and so on as well. But the strange thing about it is if it's got enough of my recording of my voice, it will learn my voice and I can type something in, select Daniel 2, and it will say it in my voice. And it's got better. The more and more of my voice it's got, the better and better it's, it's got over a period of time. So I can already 
um, with the tool. And by the way, we've got some links for some free trials of these tools in the toolkit that I'll send you afterwards. But I can deep fake myself. But I can also deep fake anyone that I've got a lot of their audio recording. So already we can't believe anything we hear. There's a recording of a politician or a celebrity saying something. If it's just audio, we can't believe it necessarily. Um, we'll be at that video stage soon as well. So big shifts, these tools becoming available to us. This is this is interesting, and this is one that we've we've been playing around with a lot recently. This is Jasper. And this is one of those uh, these natural language processing tools that I was talking about. So I've gone in here and I've literally all I've done on the left hand side, I've put title PDCA model, um, which is the Deming cycle. It's it's a marketing model. PDCA model is the content description. I said I want the tone of voice to be professional. I've hit go. And it's written this for me. And it says the PDCA model, also known as the Deming cycle, is a continuous improvement strategy used in business and industry. It involves planning a change or action, implementing the plan, checking to see if it's successful, and then making adjustments based on the results. I regularly repeat it. It's right. It's correct. And what it's done, it's, it's using all the websites, the Google stuff that's out there, grabbing that. This hasn't been copied from somewhere, but it's learned, and it's then gone through and written this. There's also then in this um, a button that allows me to go and check this exact text doesn't exist anywhere else. So it hasn't, you know, because there is a chance that it could go through, use AI to generate something, it could be exactly what someone else has written. And it will do that, it's called a plagiarism checker, it'll make sure that it doesn't do that. The worrying thing about this is that I could go through and use this, and um, I could just grab someone else's copy, put it in, select a, a paragraph and say, rewrite it, and it will rewrite it slightly differently. So there are some opportunities for plagiarism. Please do not use any tools like this if you're doing any CI assignments or anything else like that. They're really useful from a writing point of view because it can help stimulate your thinking, your structure, it can get you going. Um, I use these tools when I'm trying to plan out structure for blog posts and things like that. But what it means is the barrier to creating content is disappearing. So already, I can literally type a few prompts in and it will write something for me. I'll come back to that. Then I could use a tool like Descript, put it in, and get it read out in an automated voice. So I have a podcast of that. And then I can go through and I could use one of these kind of tools. This is Jasper as well. It does image generation. So I've literally just typed in the word here, artificial intelligence, into an artificial intelligence image, and image generator, and it's generated these four images for me. They're not great. But actually, if you play around with this, there's loads of settings that you can use, what style you want, what particular materials the art looks like and so on. And I'm able to go through and generate images that are created by AI. And therefore, this is not copyright, I can use this. Now, we discussed this on a recent podcast interview, but it's, there will be tools very, very soon, and they're already kind of there, that I can go in, type a phrase in. It will write a blog post for me. It will then go through and automatically create a voice, a podcast of that, maybe automatically publish that for me. And within the blog post, it will also generate an image that's completely unique to that podcast. If it's now that easy to do these things, there will be a lot of content being published. Most of it will be rubbish. I mean, most of it won't be great. And, that, and that's the kind of thing here. You can use these tools as an aid to help you and kind of give you some structure and so on. But a lot of people are just going to be pumping out content, low value content. Now that connects us up. The Google algorithm, we're going to talk about it in a moment in terms of content and search engine optimization is trying to really heavily differentiate content from valuable content. And they're changing their algorithm to do that because they can see this is happening. And they don't want people to write things for the search engines, we should be writing things for our target audience. Now, why this explosion of these tools? Um, OpenAI is a platform and it provides GPT-3, that's the thing that does the natural language processing. It does the writing, it does the um, sentiment analysis, all those kind of things. And then DALI, as in DALI, but DALI here, um, is something that generates art. And it's relatively new, but it's getting better all the time. So now these tools are available, loads of people are using them. Most people are using them very badly. A lot of the writing tools are terrible. Jasper's actually very good. Um, if you want to use Jasper, there's a link in the toolkit that will give you a 14-day trial and I think 10,000 free words. So you can use it for trying it out and see the kind of different things that you can do with it. It's got lots of models and frameworks in there that you can kind of play around with. But this is moving pretty quickly, which means that we've been bombarded with content already. So we're kind of switching off to that. There's going to be more content. We can use these tools to aid us or we can use these tools for, for blasting content out. And we really don't want to do that as well. 
but it changes things. It means that as marketers, we need different skills. We need to be able to use these tools effectively to get the most out of them so we're using them better than everyone else. That's had a knock-on impact as well, and I'll come to why in a moment, but already we're seeing artificial intelligence in the Google platforms. So I've gone in here to create a Google ad, but in this case, I haven't gone in and said, here's my headline, here's my text, here's my image, that's the ad, run it in front of this group of people. Instead here, I've gone in, I've put my URL in, a load of images, a load of logos, a load of videos. I've done five headlines, five descriptions, five calls to action. And then Google takes those and mixes them all up differently, does multivariate testing, and says this headline with this image, with this call to action in YouTube, Gmail, Google Search, Google Display Network, which is two and a half million websites that show Google Ads, and Discover, which is the Google app. And I basically just put all this stuff in, let it run, and the AI is going to work out, this is the best ad to show to these people. That's a real shift. It's good because it's going to optimize my ads to the right places to get the most engagement. It's not good because I lose control of my brand slightly. I don't know what image they're going to use with what heading. So it's a slight shift in, in how we're doing things. And for those brands that want very, very tight control of their brands, this is probably not ideal. Um, but for those of us who just want to optimize campaigns. Now, just to give you an example, a good Google paid search ad might get a 1% click-through rate average. A great one might get 5% on a Google text ad. We've been using this, the equivalent of this, on text ads, and we're getting an 18% click-through rate. Now, that's probably first lead advantage because there aren't that many people doing this at the moment, and then the algorithm isn't having to compete too much um, against itself. But this move to AI, this bombardment with content, means that we're using AI to optimize what people are seeing, to create the right content. So it's a real shift. And this is the perfect storm I'm talking about, of all these things kind of happening at once. So let's move on and move into privacy, because this is connected as well. So a couple of things have happened that have really had an impact. First of all, app tracking, when Apple started saying, you know, privacy, that's what we're about. And every app you went to install, it says, um, do you want to allow this app to track your activity across other companies' apps and websites? It's worded in such a way to make you think, no, thanks. And you go, no, I don't want that. Um, we think that that's cost uh, Facebook, or it will cost Facebook, about $10 billion in ad revenue because they're not able to micro-target like they used to be for this reason and for others as well. So you've got people like Facebook really struggling because they're not going to have the data they used to have because devices are now starting to block access to all this data. They used to build profiles on us so they would know what we'd done, what we'd looked at, what we were doing in other apps, what we were doing on different websites. And we were able to go through and say, okay, based on that, I know you're interested in this. It was great for marketers, not so great from a privacy point of, point of view. So this is disappearing. Then we've had the whole third party cookie piece. And this confuses a few people. So bear with me if you understand this. But if you go to a website, say it's a news website, we'll call it site one. And I'm reading the news and there's an ad on the page. And that's from the advertiser. A cookie is set on my machine to remember who I am. And that cookie is not by the site. It's not the first party cookie. It's not by the advertiser, the second party. It's actually by the advertising network, the third party. And in many cases, that third party is the Google Display Network. Well, what browsers are saying is that look, I didn't really ask for this. I mean, I did opt into it, but I didn't really actively know that I'd opted into it. So some of the browsers are going through and uh, they're blocking these third party cookies which basically means that you can't go through and track these kind of cookies. So it means there's gonna be uh, less people able to track in such a precise way. So at the moment, Safari's blocking them. Google have come out and they've said, look, we're gonna go through and block these cookies as well, but they're not gonna do it for another year and a half. Why is that? Well, it, it gives them the opportunity to go through and to use machine learning to learn from the cookies they're getting in the moment and then replace that with machine learning. So we won't have these third party cookies, we won't have such precise targeting, but it means the machine learning that's out there will be able to target these things uh, a lot more effectively as well. And we're seeing this already. So if I go through and um, I set up a Google Ads campaign and you can see here, I've got to the targeting section and it has said, okay, set your targeting. And it used to be at this point, I would go in and I would say, I want people that are in this particular region 
of this particular type and that are interested in X, Y, or Z, and it would target those people. Now it just says, do you want automatic targeting? We think it will be 20% more effective if you use automatic targeting. So this move towards privacy has meant that people that sell advertising, Facebook, Google, those kind of people, have to do things differently. And they're using machine learning solutions, which is you know, part of artificial intelligence, to be able to do that. As marketers, what does that mean? We won't have the same targeting options. We'll have to learn how to make best use out of this. So for example, when you set a Google campaign, you are able to go through and um, essentially give it some signals to say, these are the type of people that I want to target. And it will start to help the AI on its way to learn about who the right audiences are, and who you want to kind of show your content to as well. So we've got bombardment with content. We need to move to community a little bit more. We've got lots of AI tools coming in, but that overlaps with this whole privacy piece um, as well, where the advertising platforms are moving to AI-based solutions as well. From that point of view, I would really advise uh, marketers to learn a little bit about artificial intelligence. And I don't mean you need to understand the technicalities of it, but understanding you know, what's machine learning, what's pattern recognition, um, how does that fit into AI overall? What are other people doing with it? It's worth looking at some of the things that IBM have done with Watson. If you haven't looked at Project Debater, which is IBM creating artificial intelligence that could actually debate with people and create an argument and then think about what would be applications of that? How could I use it? So go through and look at those things, but it is radically changing our market. The next five years are going to be a pretty exciting ride in marketing in terms of the amount of change that we're going to see uh, and these, these different things kind of being part of that. Now, as I just said, you can take a look at this. If you go to Google ad settings, all that third party cookie data I was talking about and first party, and I'll explain in a moment, is in one place. So you can see, you know, Google knows first party, what you've searched for in Google, what you've done in YouTube, what you've done in their apps like Google Maps, because that's first party because you're on their website. But they've also got all that third party data from those two and a half million websites that show Google ads. And that's all built together to make a profile of you. And it says, for example, here, my demographic, my gender, uh, what websites I've looked at recently, what languages I speak. Um, it will tell you all the things I've shown an interest in, where I've physically been, what I've watched in YouTube, all of those things. And that's the profile they've got, but they're not gonna have that anymore. So they are using that, however, at the moment to help train this machine learning in an anonymous way. So that's how they're building. And that's why it's probably gonna be a, a year, year and a half before they move to these new solutions, because bear in mind, that's how they make a lot of their money still, by selling targeted ads. But take a look at your ad settings and see what things it thinks about you and, and knows about you in there as well. Now that leads us into one of the, the kind of uh, the last couple of sections, which is content and SEO challenges because of all this. There's more and more noise, there's more content. There's AI generated content being created um, and is out there as well. Um, so SEO has become slightly more complex. So search engine optimization, getting to the top of Google. But Google's algorithm, the better it is, the more advanced it is, the less you kind of need to worry about it. Because what Google wants, is for you to be able to do a search in Google and get really good results. So if we write content that is for our target audience and they love it and they engage with it, that's gonna tick the box for the algorithm. But how does Google know if we love content? Well, let's, let's go through and, and look at that. There are thousands of aspects of the algorithm, but these are the ones that Google tell us about and we know from experimentation that clearly have a big impact. On-page optimization, very simply, have we got the words on our pages that people are searching for? Because that would be an obvious thing to Google. You've searched this, it's on the page. Related phrases are on the page. It looks like it's on the right topic. So you're gonna go through and you're gonna make sure you understand what people are searching for. Use keyword research tools um, to go through and understand, look, I know what people are searching for. I've got those words on the page, that's, that's great. Link building is still part of this because links from other websites are still a signal that this content must be valuable. Because why would another website link to this content? Well, it have to be useful or entertaining or educational. So for some, you know, for someone to link through, there's value in that. So it's still part of the, the algorithm. And it's harder to get links because there's so much content. If anyone to bother linking through to your stuff, it must be pretty special. So we need to create special content, really good content. Social signals, people talking about your stuff. People don't talk about and link through to your content unless there's something useful in it. 
So again, that's a part, it's a small part of the algorithm, but it is part of the algorithm in there. The big one, the important one, and the one that's really grown is user behavior. And actually Core Web Vitals is part of that. And that's, do people click on your content in the search results or do they click on other results? When they get through to your content, how long are they staying on it? Are they scrolling? Are they actually engaging with that content? People get to your website, stay for a few seconds and leave. That's a terrible signal for Google because it shows they can't really, they didn't engage with the content and find it useful. But Google's algorithm is becoming much more advanced about this, trying to differentiate. Now, bear in mind, they've got data from Google Chrome. If you're using Google Chrome, which a lot of us have, if you're using GA4, well, GA4 is really allowing Google and us to not only see people got to a web page, but actually, are they scrolling? So Google Analytics for the latest iteration of Google Analytics, which we're going to talk about in a moment. So that user behavior, that's where you should be focusing. Get the words on the page, but create something that's so valuable, people are going to stay there and engage with it and use it. And Core Web Vitals, well, it's some technical factors that basically try and judge, are people enjoying your content as well? So what do we need to do? Well, we need to think about the fact that we need to create really valuable content. You've got hygiene content. It's the stuff that describes our products and services. It needs to be really optimized to have the right words and really be the best description of what we do. Hub content is the stuff we publish all the time. It's the stuff that goes out in our blog posts and so on. Great. But hero content is that content that makes people come to our website month in, month out, because it's really showing up in the search engines as well. I want every piece of hub content I create to end up being hero content. And I can do that by following all the rules of SEO but also never just go, right, let's get a blog post done, get it out, get it out. I need to create content that is really differentiated and is valuable. And there's this, this kind of test we did with this. So, you know, does it, does it really matter if people staying on your web pages for longer? Well, we went through, we tested it. We created a load of blog posts we already had, but we created videos for them. And those videos increased the dwell time on these pages. So basically people will come through, and there's a video, about a third of us end up watching a bit of the video, it means you stay on the page for longer. And what we saw is the rankings for all of those pages, the dwell time went up and the rankings went up as well. So Google is really looking at this as a factor. Are people actually staying on your pages and engaging, scrolling, playing videos, all those kind of things. When I look at my analytics, we can see that this particular blog post was driving just under 3000 visits a month on its own but almost all of those 2,671 were coming from Google. So yes, we had created this content, we'd socialized it, we tweeted and Facebooked and LinkedIn and all those different things. But then Google had said, hmm, it's got the right words on the page, people are linking to it, they're talking about it, and they're staying on the page, and therefore we started to build up those organic rankings. So the content goes from hub content to then hero content, because it's showing up in the search engines and every month it's driving traffic. So our approach to the content needs to take this. Now this is a, the original video from Rand Fishkin. Rand used to be at Moz, he now runs owns Spark Toro, another uh, digital marketing tool. But this idea of 10X content. 10X content is you go off and say, if I'm gonna create content, what's the topic? Okay, we're gonna do something on writing page titles, for example. I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna find the best content about page titles. I'm gonna do some load of research and find what I think is the best content on that topic. Not just what's at the top of Google, but the best stuff that's out there. And then I'm gonna try and do something that's 10 times better. Now, that's hard, okay? So we need to gain insights first of all, what's out there. Then how am I gonna make this 10 times better? What's gonna make it unique? Is it that I just do it for a particular, anyway, instead of going page titles, I go page titles for dentists. You know, go really specific. Or what about a beautiful interactive version or a hundred great examples? Or what is it in the format, in the presentation, the content that can, I can differentiate this piece of content? And that means rather than doing five average blog posts, I'm gonna do one that's amazing. I'm gonna take that time and I'm gonna concentrate on something and do something pretty exceptional. That will have an impact on SEO. It gets people staying in your content more, it gets people linking through to it, it gets people talking about it, and it does all of those things for SEO, it does all of the things for our target audience, it differentiates us from AI-created content, and it actually gives people the, gives us the opportunity to build an audience that we maybe can build a community from. 
So it's so important that we don't just go into content and think, right, I'm going to just knock out a few blog posts, whatever it might be. You know, if I'm doing a podcast and I do it and I don't edit it particularly well, the sound quality is not great. There's not a narrative to it. The video is pretty dodgy quality. It's just not going to stand out. So you, we have to always try and be a little bit more exceptional than what other people are doing. Now, the, the last thing I wanted to come back to before I just give you some pointers and some resources and we do some questions is, is GA4. OK, so if you're not familiar, current version of Universal Analytics. Uh, so it is Universal Analytics or GA3. Everyone calls it Universal Analytics. Most people are using it. It will cease to work uh, or it will cease to record data as of the end of July next year. OK, so everyone is having to move to GA4. Couple of problems. First of all, getting it set up properly is really difficult. So first of all, the whole of GA4 works and we call events. Events are people loading pages, scrolling, um, they're clicking, they're doing search results, submitting forms, starting films, downloading PDFs. GA4 is much better at understanding what you're doing within pages, not just loading pages. That's what the universe analytics is look at. This gives you a load more. But I'm going to want to set up some specific events that are specific to me, maybe a subscriber or making a purchase or maybe filling in a particular form. So I can then turn those into what's called conversion events. So a conversion event is saying this event is the most important one to me. I want to really track that one and work out how people got there. To set that up, you are either going to be very, very adapt in Google Tag Manager, which is quite a technical tool, or you're going to need to get your developer to do this for you. Most people are going to agencies that have got some experience in this and they are using that agency to go through and to do this work for them because it's quite technical. Out of the box, it will collect quite a lot, but we've got this set up. So um, start doing this now. One of the big challenges, you get it recording something, it takes 24 hours when anything shows up. So if you've got problems, unless you're using the kind of clever debug modes and things like that, it's not an easy thing to set up in the first place. So that's, that's the first barrier. The basic setup, get it on your website, is relatively easy but it's these custom events and these, um, these conversion events, getting those right. So I'll give you some resources for learning this. Hugely important skill at the moment. Um, really can differentiate if you're good at this stuff. Then you go, well, I'm used to universal analytics. I've got all these amazing reports. And you go into GA4 and you're like, where, where is stuff? Oh. You haven't got that many reports. And when you click on them, for example, if I went through this one, which is looking at all the pages on my website, and it used to be in Google Analytics 3, you could click on these pages and it would drill down and give you more data. I can't click on anything here. So it's quite a different interface. What I need to do is go to the search box, search for that page, the page title, and then I can add with a little plus that's down there on the page an extra field. I'm sure they're going to change this. I'm sure going to make this a more you know, a useful user experience, but it's pretty limited at the moment. Now, we are expecting that to change. We're expecting it. A product's going to develop very quickly. But it's people going to think I've set it up wrong because I, I can't find anything. And it's because it's not there, really. You have to use it a different way. But actually, there's a steep learning curve. On the menu, you'll see you've got this custom reports tab. It's the one in the middle, the blue on the left hand side. It gives you some options to start from, but I can build a report into anything. And I can display it in any way that I want. So actually, GA4 gives you a huge amount more flexibility but the learning curve is much, much steeper. So here I've, I've gone through and created a user journey. So I can say, right, people landing on my podcast page, where do they go next? Right? And they go, where do they go after that? And I can drill into their journey. I can start understanding how people are moving through my website. I can start looking at the funnels of where people are dropping out of my buying process and so on. So it is massively more powerful, but it's a much steeper learning curve. And it's, it's harder to set up properly. And there'll be a lot of people that set up not properly. So make sure that you're kind of aware of that. This is my favorite place for learning. This is Analytics Mania. Um, and this chap here has managed to get in very, very early and do loads of really great training content. He has some paid for courses. But actually, there's loads of really good free stuff in here. Um, the two that are probably worth looking at is the Google Analytics 4 for beginners. Um, that's really, really worth looking at as well. Um, and there's a one hour course, which is a really nice one. And then there's some longer ones. And then there's a Google Tag Manager tutorial. So that's worth looking at. And the stuff here you can see for event tracking. So great skill to have if you're a student and you're looking to go into work 
what a great set of skills to have. But also all of us as practitioners, we need this stuff as well. Even if we're not doing it, even if we just need to ask the right questions of other people, we're going to need to make sure we've, we've looked at this. So what are my tips? Focus on owning the relationship with the audience. Don't always rely on ads and ad targeting. How can we build a community? What might that look at like? How can I really engage with people and build those people that are truly engaged? Now, if HubSpot can do it for as a SaaS, a software as a solution business, anyone can do it. We just need to really try and engage and, and build that community. What are opportunities doing that? But always, which is what I always say, is take a step back, focus on the user journey. Does TikTok matter? Only if your target audience are using it and they're there to consume the type of content that you're planning on sharing. Should you do podcasts? Only if it fits into your target audience's journey. So always thinking about whether it's see, think, do care, race from Dave Chaffee, uh, a very traditional sales and marketing funnel. What content does your target audience want at each of these different stages and what channel are they going to consume it in? And then we can fit the right content into the right channel at the right time. So always take that step back. Who's my target audience? What does their journey look like? Where does this fit in? And if you know who your audience is, what content they need at each stage of the journey and what channel it should be in, you have the makings of a strategy. Because that's the approach that we need to take to cut through this noise, to provide value to our audience, to avoid um, getting drowned out in that AI created content and to be able to actually you know, build a community, give people the stuff that they, they really want. Now there is, there is a skills crisis and there has been for some time um, within digital marketing. We do something in partnership with the Chartered Institute of Marketing called the Digital Marketing Skills Benchmark. I'll give you the link in the moment. You can benchmark your own skills. You can benchmark your team for free um, if you've got a team as well. Um, but the point is you don't need to be 100%. You don't need to be on the outer edge of this ring. You just need to be better than the competition. The problem is that we're not great analytics and data at the moment. We're not very good at content marketing. So we're doing loads of content and we're not even measuring it. So it's, it's a kind of problem from that point of view. So um, let's kind of go through and, and, and think about how we might improve our skills um, and uh, essentially what it is that we need to learn to differentiate ourselves from this and how we can kind of go through and improve us. So I just want to give you some resources to finish up before we move into the kind of Q and A of things as well. I'm just going to take my earphones out because they've just died. So, um, right, first of all, you have got the Digital Marketing Toolkit. If you Google Digital Marketing Toolkit, you will get all the websites that I've mentioned and some free trials and things like that. So just Google Digital Marketing Toolkit. It will be number one in Google. You can download that. If you want to benchmark yourself or your team, targetinternet.com forward slash skills, and you can benchmark yourself, your team, download the full report, no email required as well. If you want that newsletter I mentioned, targetinternet.com forward slash newsletter, and for the podcast um, and all the video related to that, it's podcast. If you'd like to connect up with me and discuss any of this in the future on, on LinkedIn, it is just Daniel Rolls. Um, on Twitter, it's at Daniel Rolls. And on Instagram, it's at Target Internet. But that is me. And I'm very happy to connect you um, on any of those platforms as well. So um, I'll leave that on the screen just for a few moments before we move on to the next slide. But I think we're going to move on to questions now as well. So, Phil, are there any questions? Yes, indeed. Thanks very much, Daniel. That was uh, fascinating and actually quite scary in parts, I think. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, so we're now going to head into the Q&A, as, as you've already said. Um, but please do continue to post your questions for Daniel, and we'll try and get through as many as we can in the next 10 minutes or so. And just a little reminder for those watching via Facebook or YouTube today, that if you want to take part in future Q&As, you'll need to register on for the webinars through the CIM events page or social posts and join via the GoToWebinar platform. Okay, Daniel, uh, the first question is around uh, GA4, actually. Um, do I really need to learn GA4, and what should I look out for? Right, so the the first thing is that most organizations, like 82% of organizations that use analytics have Google Analytics. They've got two choices. They can either stop next July recording data, they can scrap Google Analytics and move to something else, that's something else could be Adobe, which is paid for tool. Fathom Analytics is a new one that's worth taking a look at. So quite a few people are moving that way. But otherwise, if you're going to stick with Google Analytics, which most people kind of want to, because, and I'll give you a reason why it's important, you're going to have to move to GA4. So therefore, learning it, really essential skill for marketers. One of the reasons we need to learn it is that Google Ads, YouTube Ads, 
um, paid search ads, all of those things, the way they now work is you go in and set your objective. And the first thing it says is, okay, you're setting this objective because we're going to probably use machine learning for targeting. We're going to use your analytics and what your goals are or your conversion events in analytics to optimize your campaign. So it's basically do stuff and it's going to keep on your analytics. It's going to say, are you getting more of people buying things, lead generation, whatever it is that you set your goals up as. So if you don't use GA4, you're actually potentially, if you're using the Google ad platforms, at a disadvantage. So we want to make sure that using GA4, if we're going to use Google ads and things like that, because it will have an impact. So yes, um, it, is, it is kind of important from that point of view. Um, but also, I would suggest that it's, it's just a really important skill um, from a marketing point of view, because so many people are using it and it's not many people have got it at the moment. So I'd really recommend that, yeah, go through, get that set of skills that the Google stuff itself, so they've got their skill shop. So if you just look at Google skill shop, Google that, there is now some GA4 stuff in there. It's only just appeared, but that YouTube channel that I mentioned is probably the best one that's out there um, at the moment. We are doing some stuff on the podcast list as well. Um, so if you just Google digital marketing podcast, you'll, you'll find the stuff with that. So um, grudgingly, it is an essential skill that a lot of people are going to need. Okay, just one, one more question on the GA4 actually. Do you think GA4 reports will replace Data Studio? It's an interesting question. So your Google Data Studio, just so people know, is something that um, allows you to take data and visualize it in different ways. They've now changed it to Looker Data Studio because they've combined another tool. And the tool they've combined was basically, if you're familiar with like Power BI, it was a data visualization tool. So you can see what they're doing is they're taking Data Studio and making it a more advanced data visualization tool. But there's a lot of things that you can now do within um, GA4 that you could never do before without extracting the data and taking it somewhere else. So to some extent, yes. Um, you can also bring data into GA4 from other platforms, like other ad platforms. So you couldn't really do that before. So there are some things it will do, but they seem to be expending Data Studio. And the, the, the advantage of Data Studio is you can bring data in from anywhere. It could be YouTube, but it could also be Facebook. It could be all sorts of things. So I think they'll they'll make Data Studio more advanced. That's Looker Studio. Um, but there is a load of stuff that J4 can do that it couldn't do before. Right. Thanks, Daniel. Um, just returning to your the start of the presentation, when you're talking about AI. Um, so the question is, if the rate of deep fakes are increasingly worrying, why then would a marketer be trusted to build relationships or a community? Well, that, that's the problem, is that as, as there are more deep fakes, there will be less and less trust. And people will be more and more suspicious of content. They'll be suspicious of brands. So actually, investing in community now is a really important thing to do because we need to build that trust. So when people don't believe anything, we go, do you know what? I'm going to go to my trusted sources. And this has already happened to some extent because we know, you know fake news, political manipulation, all those things that have happened in the last you know, five years – Actually, we now go to our trusted sources. Now, if I'm going to read the news, I will go to one of three websites that I know that I trust and, and I know they're impartial um, or, I, or I at least know their political leanings and so on as well. So actually, what's interesting, we don't talk about brand very much in digital marketing, which we should do, but brand becomes more and more important. Investing in brand becomes more important in these kind of challenging times because if I say I trust that brand, I'm going to listen to what they're saying. Yeah, why, why we do the podcast is so that people listen to us. We don't try and sell people anything at all in the, in the podcast. And then people go, do you know what? I trust those, those people. I need someone to upskill my team. I'll get them to do it. So it's that brand investment via content. So it's a challenge. And, and the question actually kind of shows what the challenge is, which is that, you know, people won't trust things. Uh, and therefore, we need to cut through that by being the trusted source, by building that authority and by building a community of people that are kind of like minded to, to cut through that. OK, I'll, continuing the theme, um, will the increasing focus on AI, machine learning, etc., potentially distract from the creativity marketers need to continue showing? Could it widen that skills gap? I think it Well, if, if you use these tools well, they can help with creativity. So having the skill to use them effectively, but the, the problem is it's going to be very easy to use these tools and not be particularly clever with them and just pump stuff out. So I think actually, if we go back to what advertising was like 50 years ago, you know, coming up with an incredible co concept that really resonates with people 
that kind of stuff still becomes even more important. AIs aren't going to crack that. I mean, eventually they will, but at the moment, they're not. So we, we think them at the moment, they are augmentation tools. They're not automation tools so that they will they'll help us do a better job. They're not going to take away what we're doing, hopefully. If we use them as automation tools, we'll publish a load of rubbish. Whereas if we use them for augmentation, it should improve what we're doing. But I think that means there's even more space for good creative because that's what's going to differentiate. And I think, you know, if we can differentiate, then that's going to cut through. And just it's just that it's always been. We see a 1,000 TV ads, but one or two would stand out. Same thing. So it just it's happening online now. It's been kind of commoditized, so we need to try and cut through that. Okay, so there's still hope. Um, again, similar theme. Uh, how can we spot AI content? Are there any red flags? Is, are, there any, are there currently any regulations surrounding this, or are there going to be? There are no regulations, but I mean, you can't you can't misrepresent someone. So there are laws already that say these things that you know I can't misrepresent someone. I can do something for parody. So there's already grey lines between that. Um, I would challenge you. And we've done this already in our podcast. We we've taken me out and replaced me a sentence with the AI and seen if anyone's noticed, and no one's noticed. And we no, we're talking like eighty thousand listeners to the podcast. We've asked people to spot an AI sentence and they get the sentence wrong. They think I'm me speaking as an AI sometimes, um, which doesn't say a lot of how I speak. But, you know, it's, it's getting hard to differentiate. I, I would challenge you. I will write something with Jasper, the AI, and I'll write something. The tone might be different, but, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily know it was written by an AI. It, was, it can be really good quality content. That's the problem. And the more advanced the AIs get, the harder this gets to do. From that point of view within audio and video there are flags uh, what's interesting and even within written copy sometimes but humans won't you know, at, at the moment with copy you and i probably won't notice but with video and audio we probably just about can still but what we're doing is we're now creating ais to recognize ai content so i can run a piece of written content through an ai and it will detect for me if it thinks it's been written by an ai with video and audio that's a lot easier so we are going to see AI being the problem and AI being the solution in some cases, but we can't put the genie back in the bottle. It's out there. Um, and it's a really big disruptive moment for marketing and for it, for society as a whole. Um, so it's interesting and it's going to be some, some challenging times ahead. Yeah. We've got um, loads and loads of questions, actually, Daniel. I think we've only got time probably for another two or three. Um, apologies if we haven't had the opportunity to ask your question. What are your top three tips on how to organically develop a new community? So the first thing you need to do is you need to be able to provide some value to that community so they would want to engage you in the first place. So we were looking at our content strategy and you know we were writing content and other people were writing content and it was quite hard to cut through with that. So we thought, what can we do differently? So that's when we went down the podcast road because we thought, well, there's not that many podcasts about digital marketing. And there's certainly not many that aren't in American accents and aren't very commercial. So that's our way into the audience. So first of all, find way into the audience, and then provide some value to them. Then we have to give them a reason to communicate with us because otherwise it's kind of broadcast. So then we would give away things. And if you want something extra, sign up for this. Give us your email address. Could be join a, a, a social platform, whatever it might be. So give them a reason to take that step. So you've got to make it as frictionless as possible. Don't let it get in the way. So you probably, in most cases, don't want a separate login on your website for a forum, for example, because I'm already on Facebook. I'm already on LinkedIn. Why would I want to do that? But it could work if you provide enough value. So you've got to provide value, give them a reason to kind of get engaged with you. And then you need to do something that gets the community speaking to each other and engaging with each other. That could be a discussion forum, but that could equally be um, having something they can vote on together. So give them the opportunity to, to vote and use that vote to decide what your next piece of content is, for example. So we need that two-way communication, but it's not just about us having two-way communication. It's about the community speaking and engaging with each other as well. And that's when you kind of hit critical mass because that's when it starts to exponentially grow. Um, and you have that. And that could just be just conversations in LinkedIn, within LinkedIn posts and encouraging debate amongst people, taking content and saying, okay, this person asked this question, that's what our next video is going to be about. So you, you actually, you have to manage that and encourage it and enable it. And if you can do that, that's when it starts to really hit critical mass. Okay, great. Um, I think it's going to have to be our last question. There are obviously um, a number of undergraduates viewing the webinar today. So 
Um, the question is, would you talk about what areas of digital marketing you have studied? See, I, I study, I mean, I, my studies originally were computer science and computer engineering. So I came into this for a really technical route. And what happened with me, I just fell into marketing when it became digital. Back in the dark ages, there was no digital marketing. Um, so that was, that was the lucky bit for me. So I think understanding some of the technical aspects, how web servers work, how to build web pages, um, all that can be really useful. Not that I'm a developer anymore, but I can tell my developers what to do and I can guide them and ask the right questions. So I think that's, a, that's an important area to, to kind of think about. I think that all marketers should study strategy, marketing strategy, marketing theory. So the traditional aspects of marketing, because there'll be loads of people with tactical channel knowledge, but they won't have the channel knowledge and the strategic stuff. And then you are gonna need the tactical knowledge, understand how TikTok works, not just that, you know, how you use it, but how does the advertising work? How does that fit into a user journey? Um, and I would say analytics and measurement is where it's at. That's the, that the opportunity to really get more from your marketing. So, and if I wanted to, you know, if I was starting off my career now and I wanted to differentiate myself, I would say you've got tech skills that can differentiate marketer. I could go through and have um, analytics skills, but creativity, creative skills as well. And then the strategy side of things. So if you can cover off, a few of those bases, that's going to help you differentiate rather than just having, you know, I've got my CM level six, I've got my degree. Doing some of this stuff in practice um, is really going to help. And I would say, you know, build some stuff, get it out there, test it. That's really worth looking at. Um, if you're not particularly technical, just as a last hint, look at some of the no code websites some tools like Bubble that allow you to build stuff without any coding. Because it will actually teach you the structure of how things work without having to need to code and you can build things and test them out so i think there's some some key areas to look at that's great some fabulous advice there thank you very much daniel um unfortunately that's all the time we've got for q and a's for today um again i'd like to thank daniel again for that fantastic presentation and we do hope you've enjoyed the session and found it interesting and worthwhile we'll be sending out a short survey about today's webinar and we'd love to hear your feedback it will only take a few minutes and all survey responses are anonymous, so please do let us know your thoughts on the session and what you'd like to see from our Marketing Club series in the future. We'll be back with our next Marketing Club webinar on Wednesday the 16th of November, again at our new time of 1pm. For that session, we'll be joined by James George. You'll find further details listed on the events page on our website, where you'll also be able to register for the session. So that just leaves me to say a final thank you for joining us today. Take care, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.